That's why I took that pill because I was letting things slip. I wasn't connecting with my community as enough. I was all work. I was taking care of so many other people and not myself. And I was like, screw that, man. If we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of other people. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But if you're ready to level up your life and get results that truly matter in your health, business, mindset, and relationships, then this is the podcast for you. Welcome to Sheer Madness, where we have unscripted, real conversations with the world's top athletes, entrepreneurs, and coaches. Discover real world and tactical advice from the best in the business. Let's go. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Sheer Madness. I am so excited about today's episode and not even a raspy voice was gonna keep me from doing today's episode because I have such an incredible guest here joining me today. Amberly Lago, she is a badass speaker, podcaster, author, and coach, and just all around incredible human. And the way we met, it's actually quite an interesting story. Um, We were following each other on social media for Mm -hmm. quite some time, and she was actually in the process of moving to the Dallas area. And she did a post, and it was about, what what did the post say? It was about pausing, the power of pause, and sometimes how you need to pause and just, like, listen to what you need and, you know, whether it's what you need mindset-wise, health-wise, what your heart's calling. So, yeah, and I think you texted me right after that. Yeah, she had done this post, and I had said pause, and I was in my morning routine, actually reading the Bible, and I had written down, pause in my notebook and I got a little bit of distraction as we all do with social media I got that dopamine (laughs) hit and I just immediately went to my my phone I started scrolling and immediately popped up Amberly's post and it said pause and I had her phone number because she had been introduced to me from a previous friend so I sent her a text message and I think I called you like you sent me a text and I was like hey (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and we we hopped on a phone call 30 minutes later, and you were moving to Dallas, and it just was the stars aligning, Mm -hmm. and I always believe that everything happens for a massive, massive purpose, Mm -hmm. and we ended up just connecting. You came to my church. Yeah, I was so touched that... I, I knew that I needed, I wanted to find a church when I moved, mm-hmm. and I wanted to find a barn for my daughter to be around like horse crazy girls. And so I had that church set up. You're like, do you want to go to church with me? And I was like, yeah, I do. So mm-hmm. I got to Texas and met you like the next week at church. Yeah. And then we've been awesome friends ever since. It's seriously crazy how much we are alike. So I'm just so honored to have you on my show here oh today. My goodness. I'm thank you so thank much. You. And one of the things I know that you talk about with your story is resilience. And as I even mentioned, like guys, she has this like energy that just like mm. radiates when she walks in every single room and makes everybody like feel so welcome. But that's not something you've always really had, right? Like you've have a pretty dark past based off of what you've shared with me, mm-hmm. based off of your book, um, the TED talk that you've done, and you've gone through a lot of hard shit in your life, Mm -hmm. a lot of pain, addiction. I want to really, really hear that story. I really want the listeners to hear that story of, you know, what you walked through because everyone looks at you and thinks, you know, this girl's just crushing it, right? She's a TEDx speaker. She's an author. She just radiates this beautiful energy. Thank you. But it took you a lot to get to that place. Oh, you're so sweet. You want to make me cry. I'm all emotional. I got here after, you know, driving two hours, had a really rough morning, and I was like, I'm good. I'm mm. almost there, but I'm really raw. I was like, and I, it was a hell of a morning, and you're like, well, that's what resilience is, right? And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, and I was just thinking about that. You know, we really need to work on our resilience and strengthen our resilience before we need it. So when mm. something happens and life takes us off guard, we have those tools to get through it. And like you, you know, I love that you grew up an athlete and a gymnast and a Mm -hmm. dancer. 
that was always a really healthy outlet for me. And I used exercise kind of as my go-to for therapy. Mm. So anytime I was discouraged or sad or anxious or even happy, I ran. And that's what I did to feel better. But um, everything changed in 2010. You know, I had this successful career in the fitness industry. Mm. I had trainers that worked with me, sponsored by Nike. Mm -hmm. um, husband, two kids, I was like, I'm living the California dream. Mm. I've like, I've worked so hard and I finally made it. And coming home from work on my Harley, uh, this SUV shoots out of a parking lot, T-bones me, and I go flying 30 feet. And as I'm sliding across the asphalt on Ventura Boulevard, I just thought, oh mm. my God. I was like, I just hope another car doesn't hit me. I couldn't tell what I was sliding into. Mm. And when I stopped, I looked down at my leg and it was just crumbled into pieces, mm. just broken into pieces. My foot was dangling off and there was blood everywhere. I didn't know at the time my femoral artery was actually severed. Mm. And um, thank goodness I had a guard. I believe in angels. I had this guy, a guardian angel. He came over right away, ripped off his belt, made a tourniquet on my leg, and he saved my life. Mm. But, you know... One of my one of the craziest things is one of the first thoughts I had is, well, gosh, this kind of sucks. I'm I'm gonna have yeah. to train clients on crutches for a while. Mm. Little did I know that I was literally dying on the street. I had, mm. you know, was taken to the hospital, put in induced coma, and when I woke up, they said, I'm sorry, there is nothing mm. we can do for you. We need to amputate your leg. You only have a one percent chance of saving it. And what I heard was, oh, one percent, then there's still a chance. Wow. You know, there's still a chance. And that's what I really hung on to. And my first thought was, OK, we need to find a doctor that's willing to take that chance mm. with me. And boy, that took an act of God, a lot of prayers, a lot of grit, a lot of resilience, um, a lot of favors, a lot of friends. Mm and got transferred and I had 34 surgeries and they piece by piece mm -hmm. put my leg back together. Um, and really that was kind of the, this sounds crazy, but that was the easy part. It was hell mm -hmm. going through that many surgeries. Like I would have a, a surgery, yeah. then a day of recovery, then a surgery and a day of recovery. And my leg was held together with what's called a halo. It's these metal rods. Mm -hmm. But when it really tested me and I hit rock bottom and I got into addiction was when I was mm -hmm. diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome, yeah. which still leaves me with chronic pain. And that's the thing, you know, pain is pain. And we're all going to have it come up in life, whether mm -hmm. it's emotional or physical. Um, you know, it's a breakup or something like my morning this morning. Mm -hmm. I was like in tears on the way here because it Life is frustrating sometimes, but when you have tools and you really have a community of people, and I swear God is so good, mm. it makes me want to cry. Right when I was having the worst moment, I get a message from a friend, a message from mm. my stepdad, a message from um, a friend of mine who has CRPS. And it was just like, um, and then I thought, okay, to get out of self-pity, frustration, shame, I need to go see how I can help somebody, how mm. I can serve, how I can be grateful. And so I reached out to one person and it's like, I just felt better immediately. Just knowing mm. that I was going to get to see you, but I was like, I might be a little yeah. raw today, a <laughs> little emotional. And I told her, like, I was like, raw is real 100%. And there's so much in that story of what you just shared of everything that you walked through. And I really even want to unpack some of those different pieces in there. Yeah. Um, because you said like, immediately when you found out there was only one percent chance uh, that you would even get to keep your leg like you had the mindset of like okay well i got one percent like yeah it's like that movie dumb or dumber i'm like yeah. so you're saying there's a chance <laughs> yeah i and i love that because i think a lot of people in that situation would you know just be like well you know this is it for me and i also yeah. know too from my own story like when i lost my own health and had all these gut issues coming from the fitness industry from being a bodybuilder yeah. there was like this massive massive 
identity piece. And honestly, that was what was the hardest part, I believe, oh, was yeah. that whole identity piece. And I was like, okay, I can almost deal with the gut issues to an extent, of course, but like the identity that I was holding on to of like, I'm Rachel, who is like incredibly fit in shape. I'm a mm-hmm. fitness model. I'm all of these different things. Do you feel like for you, there was like a massive like difficulty in that like identity shift from you? I can only imagine like fitness trainer and then like having your leg completely like smushed. Oh yeah. I mean, in my whole life, I feel like since I was a little girl, you know, I started dancing at three Mm -hmm. years old and my whole life, it was like I had so, you know, a lot of trauma, um, sexually abused Mm -hmm. by my mom's first or sorry second husband not my real dad um so sexual abuse physical abuse emotional Mm -hmm. abuse and a lot of those things how i dealt with that was i became a really good dancer yeah i became a really good athlete i became a really good student and so i really prided myself on well i can do these things like i can get stronger Mm -hmm. i can improve my physique i can be a success in the fitness industry Mm -hmm. i can be sponsored by nike and my whole identity was caught up in my image i mean i lifted with the guys and i'm sure you understand Mm -hmm. that but the girls couldn't keep up in the Mm -hmm. gym like i lifted with the guys i lifted with the guy bodybuilders and my nickname was legs Mm -hmm. because i had these massive like strong Mm -hmm. legs that i'm so grateful for because i remember when they were doing one of the surgeries they said well we might we're having to we have to do a muscle flap because we have to close up part of your leg so that means they have to take part Mm -hmm. of your calf and flip it over so they cut my calf down the middle and flipped it over to the front of my leg so my calf is actually in the front of my leg and they said if your calf's not big enough we'll have to take muscle from your lats Mm -hmm. or um maybe your quad and i was just like oh gosh my thought is still at this point Mm. more scars well I don't want to have that then I was like they're like nope your calves are big enough I'm like thank god those calves are big (laughs) thank god I did leg days all the time (laughs) thank goodness for the leg days yeah um but it that was really hard because Mm. I hated myself after this accident I mean Mm. I looked at myself with disgust I looked down Mm. at my leg with I had so much shame and in the hospital, I was like, is my husband going to love me? Am mm-hmm. I ever going to be able to even walk again? Will I ever wear shorts again? Like all the thoughts of and everything from our clients going to want to train with me. Mm-hmm. You know, I lost my identity and I really mm-hmm. had to find out who I was. I wasn't that fitness model. Like, who was I really? What did I really mm-hmm. want out of life? And it was a really good opportunity for me to start from scratch and mm-hmm. figure out what what it was that I really wanted to do, what brought me joy, um, and that we don't necessarily get, you know, I, I, I had so much, I put so much, you know, in my value and my worth as how much money I could make mm-hmm. or what I looked like. And I realized when I had no money and I was mm-hmm. $2.9 million worth of medical expenses and I was completely deformed mm-hmm. from the hip down, how was I going to get my worth? And so it was really starting from scratch to start to learn to love myself again. Wow. That's huge. And it was like, who, who is Amberly? Like, who am I right now? Because Mm -hmm. this entire existence up until this moment has been, you know, my identity with my body, my identity with the money, with all of these other different things with, you know, having it all and living in Orange County, California, the perfect life. And, it was like all of that was stripped away for a meal. But I think for like a massive purpose, as we've said this entire time, like everything happens for us for a specific reason. But it took you getting to like this low, low, low point. You even said like with with addiction and even mm-hmm. that coming in. And I don't know about you, but I have a very addictive personality type myself. And it's just been like manifested in different ways throughout my entire life, mm-hmm. um, which is where I could go to like super extremes with the fitness and bodybuilding. Or and work or work or whatever. social media or mm-hmm. I'm the same. I think we're yeah. a lot alike. Yeah. And for me, it's always finding like a healthy outlet for that, but also knowing when, okay, what are the fruits of this in my life? Is the fruits bringing me a positive or is it bringing me 
burnout, health issues, gut issues, or any of those different mm-hmm. things. But I can imagine too, like in a place of like that rock bottom for you of like, okay, all of my identity is being stripped away now at this point and my leg has been crushed. And, you know, now I have all of this pain too, like physical pain on mm-hmm. top of that emotional pain leaning into what it was like medications. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I was on, I was trying every, when I was diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome, mm. you know, I don't recommend Googling it because <laughs> it's bad. Like mm. it's, you know, it's called or dubbed the suicide disease because it is ranked highest on the pain mm. scale. And so, oh, and the doctor told me, well, you need to go home and get back in your wheelchair. You're going to be permanently, you know, disabled. You're going to have to wear, per- you know, probably wear orthopedic shoes. And I was like, I am not wearing orthopedic shoes like that. I am not I am not getting back in that wheelchair like that is not my life. Nothing wrong with wheelchairs. My brother's been in a wheelchair his whole life. But I was like, that's not the life that I imagined. There's got to be more. But when I tried all these medications and I mean some invasive procedures like a spinal cord stimulator where they implant metal leads into your Mm. spine and they implant a box Mm. into your glute in a knob and you literally turn this machine on ketamine infusions eastern western medicine 73 homeopathic pills Mm. of all the gut disruptors (laughs) all yeah 11 prescription Mm. medications and nothing was working and that led me down a road of like trying to desperately get out of pain Mm. not knowing how and discovering drinking and just trying to numb out, man, I just needed a reprieve. I just Mm. needed a break. It was like feeling like I had this vice grip on my Mm. foot all the time, but it wasn't just the physical pain. It was the shame. Mm. It was the, the sadness and I became very depressed. And, um, the doctors tried to put me on like three different medications for depression and I would throw them up I couldn't take them and I'm like what's worse like throwing up every day or trying to take this medication Mm -hmm. and I remember telling one of the therapists I said if I can just work out I know I'll feel better Mm -hmm. and she goes well if you have to work out every day then you definitely need to be medicated and I was like that was the response that was the response and I left there crying basically telling my husband yep well it's confirmed i'm crazy Mm. but i knew that if i could just move somehow i would feel better and so um that's what helped me um get out of addiction um get out of bed fitness helped you oh for sure Mm. it has my whole life but when i couldn't run the way that i used to I kept getting stuck on, well, I used to be able to do these things and I can't do these things. It was so negative. Mm. And when I discovered drinking, that worked until it didn't Mm -hmm. work to drown out the the voices, the negative, the critic, the shame, the pain. Mm. And then I would wake up and it would be this whole cycle of starting over. And it was like I was trying to pretend like on the outside I was trying to hold it all up and everything together on the inside. I was just literally mm. dying. And I remember there was this moment where I was like, "There, this cannot be. I can't believe I have survived this horrible accident mm. only to be slowly killing myself mm. with alcohol. Yeah. And so um, I reached out for help. Probably one of the scariest things I had done was actually go to a recovery meeting. Mm. It, I was more nervous and scared, and I, I was having withdrawal from alcohol. I was like, how did a good girl like me end up like this? Like, mm. a fitness person, a successful person, married to a lieutenant commander mm. who arrests people who are drunks like me, end up like this. So I remember going to my husband and saying, I think I got a problem. Mm. He's like, oh, no, 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 you don't have a problem. I said, no, I think I do. I think I need to go to, like, mm. recovery, like a meeting. And he goes... No, you don't want to be around those people. Like mm. his idea, how can I be married Only to somebody? Only further like erotic or initiated that shame, I can imagine. Oh, too. yeah. Like, but you're not one of those people. You're those not Those people that. are different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But That's I knew tough. deep down, I knew I had a problem. And if I was going to get out of it, I couldn't do it alone. Mm. So thankfully, uh, I prayed 
I reached out to a friend. Um, I didn't hear back from him. And I was like, I'm literally going to die. Like, I need help now. So I Googled recovery mm-hmm. meetings and I found a time where I could go when my husband was working and my daughters were in school, walked into a 12 step meeting and um, sat in between a nun and a cowgirl. I'm like, where the hell am I? <laughs> what is this? Mm. But I heard hope. Mm. I heard women sharing my story and how they got through it. And I felt like I wasn't alone. And I just kept going back and one day at a time. And it's still work. I mean, I still do everything I can. Start my day with gratitude. Start my day with reading. I go to meetings. I still, you know, I have a group of girls. We call ourselves the God Squad, and we text Mm -hmm. each other every day. It's that accountability, but it's asking for help Mm -hmm. and knowing that you're not alone. Because I think so many people, when they're in pain, or for me anyway, when I was in pain, I just started to isolate. My world got smaller and smaller, and I didn't want people to know I was in so much pain. And when I feel myself starting to isolate like that, that's that's huge for me. It's yeah. like red flag for me. I need to reach out because, you know, the, the opposite of addiction, I think, is connection mm. and having people and having community and accountability. Mm. And that's been one of the hardest things for me was being at that lowest low of surviving this accident, losing my career, having a lean on our house losing my identity, being a freaking alcoholic Mm. to how am I going to get out of this? And one day at a time, I've been able to get more than the life I had. I've been able to get a better life, a life Mm. with joy and to thrive, not just survive. Yeah, I think that's so powerful of what you said about like addiction and that place of just massive pain and really raising your hand and saying, you know what, I need help. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to go through this alone anymore. And I know, like, when it comes to shame, you know, shame only can really survive, right, when we keep it inward. And when Mm -hmm. we speak shame out loud, that's where shame can be demolished because we put it out into existence. We speak it into truth, and we're really able to really say what is the actual truth ultimately that's happening here and take that accountability so i'm really hearing from you like one of the very first steps for you to to heal or even reach acceptance with where you were at was to raise your hand and say hey you know what i need help i need to tell my husband that i need help i need to find a group i need to find a community Mm -hmm. of people i can surround myself with who i can relate to and who can support me and it sounds like that's been like a catalyst you know throughout your entire life and i think that's also one of the big reasons as to why you know you have such an incredible energy about you too is just because of like your desire to want to help people and add value to people in so many different ways but i also even heard you mention um the part about service too Mm -hmm. and i think that's a very crucial part to even mention as well because i think when we go through something painful how we really really can begin to heal is start helping people who are going through what you've walked through, even what you're going through as well too. Cause then that's where we can not only like heal ourselves, but we begin to actually help other people heal around us as well too. So community was like a huge, huge part oh, for yeah. you. Yeah. What else do you feel like really helped you get to that place of acceptance, but then create that catalyst to like, okay, what is it that i want to create for my life where am i going because i know so many people who are listening right now whether they're in a place of pain maybe they're not quite at rock bottom yet and i wish people didn't have to get to that rock bottom that place of addiction of massive pain whether it's Mm -hmm. a physical pain or emotional pain but for a lot of people they do they have to get to that place and then it's like what do i do where do i go from here but it also is an incredible opportunity to really be like What do I want for my life? What do I want Mm -hmm. to create? Who do I want to become? Especially for you having your entire identity like completely stripped away. It was like this blank slate. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing you raising your hand first. Well, it was like acceptance. I I was like, I I had to get really brutally Mm -hmm. honest with myself. And I think that we all go through times where we know we've created habits that are not Mm -hmm. serving us or we know when we're doing something that is not the best for us, whether that is like 
you know, eating cookies every night before bed mm. or, you know, pushing the snooze button a million times. Or maybe it is having wine, uh, pouring a glass of wine or two or three every night to like try to just, oh, I deserve this. I can, you know, mm. I need to relax or whatever. Um, but I think it really takes being real with yourself and getting mm. honest. And that's the most important thing for me mm. is to have that honesty and be in acceptance and then create like habits that are going to support that. And I will tell you, you know, about almost a year ago, it'll be a year ago next month, I lost my sobriety for a day. So I got mm. sober in 2016. I was, boy, I was having, I had just gotten back from a trip. I'd been dealing with the lawyers, my, my little brother got mixed mm. up in drugs and drinking and he sits on death row in Texas and I dealt with his lawyer we're trying to do an appeal and my somebody had hired for work disappeared on me like you name mm. it anything and everything that had gone wrong went wrong and instead of reaching out I took a pill I mm. took a pain pill I what I, I could handle the pain I took it for the wrong reason mm. and I knew as soon as I took it I lost my sobriety and I wish I could say, oh, I was flying high. It was awesome. Mm. I didn't. I went to bed and the next morning I had enough recovery in me to call my sponsor and say, I really screwed up mm. and I got right back in the program and I share that because dang it, it was hard being that honest. Mm. But I know that if I am not 100% honest with myself, I don't get to keep my sobriety. I don't get to keep great relationships. I don't get to keep business partners. That's so important. So I think acceptance, mm. starting where you are, like really starting where you are, using what you have and doing what you can. And so reaching out to somebody, not doing it alone. And I think that so much is getting your mindset right. And mm. I had a lot to work on with that because my inner critic was loud and mean. And so... I had to really pay attention to what that soundtrack was mm. in my head. And every time I would hear myself saying, I can't do this, or gosh, this sucks, or I would shift it to gratitude immediately. Mm. So I think the quickest way to shift your perspective is with gratitude. That's what I did on the car ride here, mm. literally. I was like having a pity party. <laughs> I was on the 405, mm. like ugly crying mm. like just letting it all out and I was like dude Amberly, what are the tools mm. so I think it's you accept it whatever yeah. it's going on in your life and then go okay well what can I control and what what's out of my mm. control don't worry about that stuff let it go then reach out mm. ask for help and then I, I swear this seems so simple but it's the the easiest way to feel better is gratitude yeah. and I learned that in the hospital bed when I was spiraling down into a depression every time I'd look down at my leg and I would just think of everything I was grateful for mm -hmm. for my family that was there to see me and support me the great doctors and nurses the people were bringing me food mm -hmm. that I had a view I couldn't go outside but I, I could see outside mm -hmm. I had a window to look out of and and I, I gratitude became my medicine and I did know how movement was my medicine, mm. too. And so the doctors thought I was crazy because I was like, I just need a pull up bar mm -hmm. installed over the bed. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I, love I need a pull up bar. Yeah. My friend at the gym brought me some dumbbells and um, we just came across some pictures. We were going through our old uh, computer in a picture and it's got a picture of my daughter who was two at the time. And then on my little table next to me were my dumbbells and a picture of my daughters, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's important to know what works for you. For me, it's movement, but mm -hmm. personally, I think that movement moves your mood. And I think that if everybody moved their body a little bit more, mm -hmm. they would feel better. Seriously. I mean, what did I do Seriously. when I came in here? Yeah. I said, so I she just- did push-ups. I was like, <laughs> I just got, I drove like two, two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. I was like, don't mind me. I'm just gonna do some push-ups real quick because it, 
lets your body know. It's like releases those endorphins. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel better. And I am so thankful that I had that fitness mm -hmm. dance and fitness background because that really pulled me through so many times where if I didn't have that, maybe I would have given up. Yeah. I don't know. I you think know. like the power of fitness is so underestimated and mm -hmm. people just turn to it for I just am doing it to lose weight or I'm just doing it for this specific outcome but the people who really are into fitness and they do it long term they're not doing it because of to get the big legs or for to build the booty get the six pack although those are definitely like those a are nice like byproduct it's like a byproduct of you doing the work but really it's because I like how I show up for myself in this. I like how it changes my state. This is my therapy. I know I can be having the shittiest day ever. And I walk in, I move my body, I change my state. Motion creates emotion. So I know for myself, I can definitely be like at like a very, very low place, end of a work day, just exhausted, burnt out, go get in a workout. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? Life yeah. really isn't that bad. I was just focusing on everything that was wrong around me. I wasn't really leaning into gratitude, just like you mentioned there. But just like changing our state, it, it changes the lens. We also get blood flow to our brain too. Mm -hmm. And very often we have like this low blood flow, like when you're sitting in the car, driving for two and a half hours. It's just so easy to pinpoint all of these things in our life that are going going wrong. I loved um, at the seminar that we were actually at this, this weekend with this guy named Wes Watson who was in prison for 10 years, you guys. And he said that, you know, in prison, you could literally look around at everything and be like, oh my gosh, like l everything's wrong and like point out everything like that is like wrong. Like there is so hard to find anything like that is like good in prison, especially when you're in there for 10 years. So what he really had to do is he had to, right, like lean into like, what is he grateful for? Because if he leaned into like that scarcity mindset of everything that's wrong, it'd be like, well, fuck, I'm in prison. <laughs> like, yeah. everything is wrong. Like, the food, the work, like, everything's been taken away from me. So I think what is so cool about your journey and, like, creating that resilience has been, like, in a place of, you know, having massive amount of physical pain, emotional pain, addiction, you know, when things are just, like, it feels like coming at you, like life is coming at you, but being able to be like, you know what? These are the things that are awesome in my life. These are mm -hmm. the things that I am so grateful for. I'm grateful for that I have a window here in my hospital room. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for the fact that, you know, I have my family, my husband, I have all of these different things. And I think it doesn't always mean that like, we can't want to change the things that aren't necessarily working well in our life. But I think it is saying, you know what? This is really what I'm fighting for ultimately. And I think that is what is so powerful. That's what gratitude is about is like, these are the things that are incredible in my life. And these are the things that I want more of. And then I'm fighting for ultimately because this version of me, if I just lean into this and I focus on everything that's wrong, I'm only going to continue to get more of that and mm -hmm. more of that in my life because right our our thoughts create our feelings our feelings create our habits mm -hmm. leading to things like addiction whatever it may be especially if we have these toxic negative you know self-talk if we have shame that shame of course is going to lead us to like hiding and wanting to like go into a shell putting on this mask when we go out in public but when we can be like what you said like just so brutally honest with ourselves mm -hmm. like there's a power that comes with that like we're able to look at ourselves and even if we're like not super proud in the moment of like who we are like looking back in the mirror we know that that is something that is very very powerful because we're taking massive ownership so it is a very empowering step in that well and too you know when you own it when you own your story mm. i mean it was for me just being able to wear shorts again and wear things mm. that show all the scars on my leg i started to view myself differently instead of looking at you know you can shift your perspective like that mm -hmm. sometimes we need people to help us do that sometimes mm -hmm. but you know I stopped looking at my leg as scarred and deformed and ugly and it's in pain and it doesn't work properly and I started looking at it as this leg's a miracle this leg mm -hmm. is healing it took two years for the non-union of my bone mm -hmm. to grow back together the body's amazing and the human spirit is powerful. And I also had to think about, like, I was asking myself the mm -hmm. wrong questions. I was asking myself, like, well, 
how am I going to get through this? What am I going to do? How am I going to like start training clients again? Like I was just asking the wrong questions when I started to say, why, Mm. why am I going to get through this? That activated Mm. my energy that activated my human spirit. My why was I wanted to be an example of resilience for Mm. my daughters, for my clients, I mean, for family, I want I wanted to be an example of resilience and I wanted to be an example of a victor of my mm. life and not a victim. And so, you know, when I started when you start to ask the right questions and when you start to shift your mindset and you do it on a b- daily basis, you start to every day you stick to that, you start to build your confidence. Mm. You start to be able to love yourself a little bit mm. more. And then it's freedom. You feel comfortable in your own skin. And when you can show up that way, it gives other people permission to do the same. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people, you know, and I had people go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're writing about sexual abuse in your book. And I'm like, yep, it's right on the back Mm -hmm. cover. And there was that little part of me that was like, oh, God, all the PTA moms are going to see that. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, well, it's out there now. Mm -hmm. And I had so many men and women not just women, but men Mm -hmm. come up to me and say, thank you for writing about that sexual abuse. I was abused too. Now I've walked in shame and I feel like I can walk with dignity and not let Mm -hmm. that hold me down. So when you show up and you are, you know, yourself, you're accepting of maybe, you know, flaws or whatever, it gives other people to go, hey, Mm -hmm. I've got scars too, whether that's internally, you know, emotional scars or external like Mm. literally scars on your body i've had people that have had double mastectomies that were felt disempowered and when they see me working out in my boots with all my scars they're like heck yeah man i earned those scars like it's a sign that look at what i've overcome Mm. and so um and i think that energy is contagious you know it was funny this morning talking about working out it somebody asked me the other day they were talking about, you know, oh, yeah, we were coming back from this event last week, and it was one of the other speakers, and he was talking about, yeah, I'm going on vacation. As soon as I'm back from vacation, I'm going to start working out and losing weight. And I'm like, as soon as you get back from Mm. vacation, I was like, vacation, my favorite part of vacation is that I get more time to work out. That's my favorite part. Like, I get up early. And I'm like, I have a full hour to work out. Like, because mm. there's some days I just get 20 minutes. And I'm like, it becomes something that you know that adds so much value to your life and mm. how you think and how you feel that you're like, heck yeah, I don't want to miss that. And sure, you know, it can be hard to to journal every day and to pray and to reach out and to have that gratitude practice and to work out and eat healthy, but it is a hell of a lot easier than a life of misery. Yeah. It's a lot harder to be depressed and just negative self-talk every single day and just being so unhappy with the person that you're looking at in the mirror. And hopefully we don't ever have to get to that point, but I think for some people like we do. I know I had to get to that point for myself and my own journey to really create that catalyst for change, but I think that's so cool of what you've mentioned about like talking about like the the sexual abuse portion because if you in that moment would have shrunk out of fear of rubbing anybody the wrong way or on stepping on anybody's toes you wouldn't have put your story out there that made a massive impact in all of these other people's lives like people need to hear your story they need to know what you walked through so there's power in putting that out there sharing your story because it helps other people and I think that's honestly what this entire journey is about this entire journey ultimately at the end of the day is about doing the work what we need to heal we all need to heal in some Uh way shape or form whether it's physical healing healing your guts healing from trauma we all have some degree of trauma in our life that's been running the show creating our story that's been running through our mind but I think when we can heal lean into it face it like what you talked about be radically honest with ourselves. do the work act in spite of thoughts feelings moods and emotions even when we don't feel like it I can imagine there's days where you like you said you don't want to journal you don't want to do the workouts and all well, of those I always di- feel yeah, better but, it's like I've you, never yeah. done a workout and been like oh I wish I wouldn't have done that yeah never never in my life and, yeah and it affects everybody around you like for mm-hmm. me my daughter 
I used to go, oh, Mom, you're going to the gym. You're leaving me. And now she's my favorite workout partner. Mm. She's like, Mom, you ready to go to the gym? So we can tell our kids things, but they really learn from seeing what we do. Yeah. This morning, you know, I spent the night last night with my adopted mom and dad, my California adopted mom and dad. And um, they said, I said, uh, I probably get up early and work out and uh, they said, well, we got this community gym here. I'm like, you do? That's awesome. I can just use your gym. And because I worked out, my dad, my adopted dad, decided to go mm-hmm. work out too. And he hadn't worked out in months. Mm-hmm. And so, like, when you step into doing these healthy habits, you can be an example for someone else. And you know, I understand like the the shame. I had a lot of shame that I did therapy for. I read books. I cried. I think the first year I was sober, I cried every single mm-hmm. day. Like tears. There was a time in my life where I didn't cry for years. Like I, mm-hmm. I was completely shut down. And so I think when I got sober, like the floodgates were open. Mm-hmm. I actually had to feel feelings yeah. for All the that first tra- time. Trauma and it energy. was just like it letting was, it out. Mm-hmm. And and what I learned is like you know whatever you're going through, your mess or whatever your circumstances are that you might think are so shameful or so bad or so hard, perfectly qualifies you to help somebody Mm. else who's going through it. And I know know you and I have had that conversation about it too. Like there's people who teach resilience, who've read it in a book, but it's so different from someone who's walked through like all the darkest valleys and have had to come out on the other side that's the person that i would want to work with is my coach to help me and that's why i'm so fascinated with you like seriously i would hire you over any doctor because you have walked the walk you don't just talk talk you like walked it you understand it from going through your own Mm -hmm. healing journey and all that you went through and all the doctor's appointments, you understand what it feels like to actually go through that stuff. And I think that's why I can connect with people Mm -hmm. is because I'm like, oh yeah, I know how that feels Mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, struggle when, you know, with sobriety or to have to reinvent yourself or, you know, like five years ago, I didn't even own a computer, Mm -hmm. like didn't own a computer. I didn't have social media. And I just had this vision of something I wanted to do. Mm. So I believe that if you have a vision, if you create these healthy habits and you just do one thing, one day at a time, anything is possible. Mm. There's going to be people that are going to think you're crazy. There's going to be naysayers. There's going to be, I mean, I even had people that were close to me that were like, you're crazy. Yeah, sometimes what? it's the closest people to you because yeah. they've been so close to you for so long that they, they can't see, you know, the trajectory or your vision or your dreams. And it's hard for them to support it. It really mm-hmm. is. But when you, I think it's so important when you have a vision to feed that vision with positivity mm-hmm. every day, um, have the hope and and do it with love. I think that grit is is driven with love mm-hmm. and, it, and that you find people. Uh, and I've learned this a little bit later in my entrepreneurial journey. I wish I had this sooner. I mean, I always had a mentor, whether I was, you know, I had a mentor when I was a dance teacher that helped me become a dance teacher. I had a mentor when I was a mm-hmm. fitness trainer that helped me become the top fitness trainer or earner at the gym. But writing a book, I'm like, holy cow, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? And so I was like really winging it. And then later I discovered, oh, my God, there are like masterminds that you can Mm -hmm. do that you can. There are coaches that you can hire. So I think it's important to find people who have walked through that journey and gotten to the other Mm -hmm. side and ask them how they did it. Like, can you be mentored? Can you be coached? Can how can you learn from them? And also like literally google google it like yeah (laughs) i have googled so much you know um and learn still learning yeah you know um i think for myself too like that is the ultimate goal every single day like i have to be like learning something new and i i can only imagine too like with you going through everything you went through and like the pain and having to come out and like that resilience that that's now been this massive like just catalyst for so much change in other areas of your life of just like at 
fuck, I went through this. Like, I can achieve whatever the hell I want in life. Like, write the book, speak, do it, all of these different things. And I know for myself, too, like, it's done wonders. And I get to, like, now look back and be like, you know what? I'm actually so grateful that I walked through that. You know, Mm -hmm. that I had all of those gut issues, that I was forced to have to confront all of my pain and my trauma because I wouldn't be the person that I am now today. But it also created like an unshakable confidence in that. Um, My confidence gets knocked out of me sometimes. mm -hmm. I mean, it will get knocked right out of me. So I am not like this. I mean, I'm, I'm confident in some areas like... Like, I've never had a problem walking into a room and introducing myself Mm -hmm. or, you know, I'm not that way. But there's sometimes like, for instance, when I was going to do my TED talk, I was scared to death. I was the only person that didn't have a Ph.D. And those that that inner critic, that bully Mm -hmm. came out of the cage and was like, who do you think you are? You're not smart enough. You don't have a college education. You don't have all those initials after your Mm -hmm. name. And I really had one of my clients that helped me. Like I was freaking out and my client said to me, she said- But you still did it. And I think that's also the big part of it. So I even wanna like like shift that too, because I get that, right? I get the negative self-talk, I'll have all of that. Heck, I get nervous podcasting and speaking still to this day and I get all of that negative self-talk. But I think part of it is you still have this inner belief of, you know what? I'm having this negative self-talk. I'm having these You can fears, change it. But I'm gonna do it despite it because there's this little piece of you that knows you can do it. And I think you do have that in anything that you do. Yeah, I think I like a good challenge. And I've been kind of the underdog a lot of times in my life. And that's just fuel to me. Like that, I, I think that with grit, it takes a little stubbornness. Mm-hmm. It takes a little, a little bit of fear of failure and a little bit of, um, you know, wanting to prove, prove that mm-hmm. you can do it. But one thing that my client helped me with is she said, Amberly. You over, You got through 34 surgeries. Mm-hmm. You can get on that stage and talk. And so I was like, Truth. oh, Truth. yeah. So now I'm just like, okay, I remember that. I pray. I do push-ups. And I'm like, I'm good to go. Let me go for it. You mm-hmm. know? And I think that's just like one of the bricks you add to. It's like we have this like negative self-talk. We have this fear. We act in spite of it. You're like, you know what? I'm going to freaking do it. And then you crush it. Like you've crushed like all of the talks mm-hmm. that I know that I've listened to that you've done. But then you get a look back and you say, you know what? I did deserve to be up there. I did. I crushed it. I did awesome. You know, doesn't mean like that self-talk doesn't come out, that story. And I honestly think like part of the trauma is like that story never goes away that talk completely but it gets a little quieter we question it when it comes out we go oh i know that you know this osg this old self gravity is coming up but i know it's not true i know this is coming from this thing that happened to me when i was younger and it's not true this is the actual truth Uh that I'm strong, that I'm capable, that I deserve to be up there, that I have gotten 30 freaking surgeries and I've overcome all of that and I can do this TED Talk too. Well, I I was interviewing um, someone on my podcast and they actually gave their inner critic or any inner bully or their anxiety um, a name. Mm, Like they they like, oh, hey, Kyle, there you are talking to me again. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I should try that. Aaron calls his Pam. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Passive aggressive man. (laughs) Pam. (laughs) Oh, I love that. So we all should name it. (laughs) Name our inner critic. I love that. Yeah, it was actually, I was interviewing Dave Hollis on my podcast, and he's like, oh, yeah, I name it. And I just like, okay, Mm -hmm. what are you trying to tell me? And yeah, I don't need you to protect me against anything like that. So you can just go away, quiet Mm -hmm. down over there. And it's like, he goes, people think I'm crazy because I'll actually talk to myself. And I'm like, oh, well, if it works, it works. Maybe Mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. Yeah. For you, like on the confidence piece, even like going back to that a little bit, what do you think for you has helped the most with like building those bricks and really stacking them? Of confidence? Mm Mm-hmm taking action Mm. every day taking action um for me it's keeping my promises to myself like i can't tell you how many times the alarm goes off and i'm like man i want to push that snooze 
Mm-hmm. You know, so I even I even did this this morning. Okay, this is I'm gonna admit it. I love pushing that snooze because I feel like it's like, oh, I stole a little more sleep. And so I know I want to get up at five. So I'm like, okay, I play these tricks with myself and it's just stupid. I should just like get up, you know, but I set my alarm to 445 so I could push snooze Mm -hmm. and then still get up at five, you know, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, okay, I still got my snooze in. I'm still Mm -hmm. up at five. That's terrible. I should. You're still up at the time you said. (laughs) I still up at the time, but whatever you have to do to try to to do, but, but to keep those promises to Mm -hmm. yourself, like I promised myself I would get up at five. I did it in a weird way, but I got up at five, you know, Mm -hmm. and that was like a check for my confidence. Mm -hmm. I, you know, downed my gut health drink. That's a check for my health, Uh, building my confidence. I got my workout in, did that, got doctor's appointment, although it didn't go well. I still made that time. It's like all the little things that you promise yourself that you're going to do and you and you hold you keep Mm -hmm. those promises. It builds your confidence. And I think that doing things that are uncomfortable, the more that you do it, the more confident you become because you become more capable. Mm. But I think action just not just alleviates fear and anxiety for me, but it starts to build my confidence. Mm -hmm. Massively, massively. And I've had many conversations with my clients too, where I'm like, hey, I'm going out to dinner. Um, And they'll like, want to stay on their nutrition program right that i like created for them but then they will give in to peer pressure foods like the chips and the salsa that's at the table and they have this massive guilt or even shame that comes over after them and of course like we have to have a level of like okay grace empathy you know but taking the lessons and extracting them and moving forward because no one wants to feel that after but what i always tell my clients is i'm like you know what i don't care if you go out to dinner and you want to enjoy yourself i said but that needs to be your intention going into it. Mm-hmm. Like your intention going into it is, hey, you know what? I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to have a drink. Like if, if you like to have a drink every now and then, I'm going to have, you know, my chips and salsa. And then I'm going to go home. And then you feel no shame. You feel no guilt after that. But I think mm-hmm. what's really difficult is just like what you said. You go into it with a certain intention, but then you don't follow through on that commitment that you made to yourself. And over time, that's eroding and eroding your confidence. So it's, it's really the small stuff, what I'm really hearing you saying of like you know not pressing that snooze button waking up at five if I say I'm gonna wake up at five if I say I'm gonna get in that workout in the morning getting in that workout like I'm a big believer of like even if your workout is like 10 minutes 20 minutes, it helps like that's still you keeping that commitment and mm-hmm. I know many times where I've had like podcasts and like incredibly busy days that's like all it was like yeah. I was like you know what I got 10 minutes but you know what that 10 minutes changed my state it gave me a confidence because I followed through on that commitment mm-hmm. I'm a big believer of doing something for a mindset in the morning um, whether it's reading a book um, journaling like what you like to do prayer whatever that may be meditation for some people mm-hmm. and then some kind of movement and both of those two combined we stack these wins there at the beginning of the day and when we stack the wins at the beginning of the day end of the day I think just like and the over- end of the day too like I I, yeah I I ask my daughter at the end of the day every night what's the best thing that happened Mm. to you and what's one thing you're grateful for and most of the time it's pretty silly but going to bed on a note where you're focusing Mm. on what's one good thing like the best thing that happened like maybe it's something that you made that deadline you launched a course you Mm. wrote pages of a book you got a new client you reached out to 50 new clients that are prospects, Mm. whatever it may be, but what's the best thing that happened and what's one thing you're grateful for? And I go to bed in that state, your subconscious, Mm. and you wake up feeling better. But also I think that, you know, when I'm really kind of struggling to have a squad, Mm. you know, I've got you and a few other friends. I love bringing people together. So I was like, let's meet once a month. Me, you, mm-hmm. Dr. Lyon, we'll get LGO, Brooke him, we'll get these women together. And I was having a moment where I had somebody that had said some things that I was like, gosh, that kind of shook me up a little mm-hmm. bit. And you guys were like my cheer squad and my hype girls and like, you got this, go for it. You're mm-hmm. going to kill it. Like all the things. Yeah, right before you did your last talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that helped so much. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think it helps when somebody can just, like for me, 
I did not have confidence in myself or the way I looked after my accident. And my husband loved me until I could love mm-hmm. myself. My doctor is the reason I started to look at my leg differently because mm-hmm. I wanted to have it amputated about a year after it was giving me so much pain. I walked in, I was like, look, I know you've done 34 surgeries. I really appreciate you, but we need to go ahead and cut this leg off. It's holding me back. It's giving me too much pain. He's like, we can't do that. You have CRPS. And then he put my leg in his lap and he looked at it like it was a masterpiece. Now I was looking at it like, I can't believe he's putting my disgusting deformed Mm -hmm. leg on his nice white coat. And the way he looked at it, I just, it made me, you know, tears came down and something Mm -hmm. shifted in me where I thought, If he can look at it that way, maybe I can learn to look at it that way, too. And so every day I just started to be grateful that it held me up, grateful that it was healing and things started to shift. And so I think that, you know, it's the things that we tell ourselves. It's surrounding ourselves with people who can be supportive and love us until we can love ourselves. And it's building on those daily habits and keeping the promises to ourselves. I think that's so beautiful and that giving you that like perception just shift overall because I know there has been many people in my life too where I've I've had that negative self-talk I've been like beating myself up and even like after I've done like a podcast or like a public speaking event I was like oh my god that was like awful you know we've, we've all been there before oh, like yeah. we're our own worst critic but then they were like that was the best one you ever did and I was like really I know. And then all of a sudden, like, my confidence comes right back up, you know, and not saying to, like, rely on other people, but I think it's the people who matter, right, in our life. It's like, don't give a shit what everybody thinks, but give a shit of what some people think. When the people that keep it real mm -hmm. with you, like, I know my husband keeps it real with me. Like, sometimes the truth actually hurts Mm -hmm. when he sells me something. But I know when he tells me something, it's the truth. And mm. and he is real good at snapping me out of like, uh, you know, I was the other day, I was like, oh, I'm so sad. Ruby wants, my daughter wants to run with me and I can't run. Oh, I just wish I could run. I wish I could run the way I used to. And he's like, ride your bike beside her. And I was like, mm. oh, yeah, there's another way of doing things. And so I think that's part mm. of resilience too, is having those people around yeah. you but also sometimes having them kind of knock some perspective in or different ideas. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, I'm so grateful for my boyfriend, Aaron, because he knows like my inner dialogue and talk is sometimes like that just massive pressure, right? Like never enough, do more like that striving, which has gotten me so many different places of life, almost to a fault. Gun issues, these different things that we'll dive into. And when I go on your podcast, but sometimes he just literally like starts to put his hand over my heart and he'll just like rub my heart and he goes, you're doing a really good job humaning. He's like, you're doing a really good job humaning. And it's like so simple. And then I can just like feel my energy just like completely shift and be like, oh my gosh, I'm putting so much pressure on myself. Yeah. And it's just like hearing it from like the people who matter and surrounding yourself with like other women. I think like, for women too who are ambitious who Mm -hmm. are out there speaking podcasting wanting to like create something of their life and not just spend time just like talking about people or gossiping or going out drinking or partying like your circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller over time so when you find those people you like hold on to them i'm like amberly yes i'm I'm holding here (laughs) i'm holding on to you you're mine yes (laughs) you're mine but i think it's so cool and i always like tell my clients like pay attention to your energy it's the energy you're around people because we'll we'll hang up together um, we'll have our legendary women's monthly call. And after I'm like, I am on cloud nine. I feel so confident. I'm going to go crush it. But pay attention to the people like who you leave after. And you're like, I feel worse about myself. I feel depleted with my energy. Uh-huh. You know, like it is really the fruits of everything in life. And I mm-hmm. think if we start to really pay attention to these fruits, like things aren't always good or bad. It's kind of like what you mentioned too, with like when you were in that place of, um, of pain and you took that pain medication and it depended on the fruits of that for you and I think there could have been potentially a setting where it would have been your you know your intention going in was really really for really a place I of was purity. in pain yeah, but I knew it wasn't purity. my intention mm-hmm. it was like I wanted 
to escape my mm. thoughts. I wanted relief. And instead of praying, reaching out, it's all about the intentions behind yeah, it. Yeah. And really, really listening to our gut too. Like really, I think if we get quiet enough, we slow down enough, we really, really listen. Like we know, we know, but yeah. we just like put everything in a box. We put it in a corner. We're like, I don't want to address this pain. I don't want to confront it. You know? So it's really, like you said, this throughout this entire podcast, like getting massively real with yourself and confronting those demons, dancing with them, um, creating a group of women, a tribe of people that just like build you up, that make you feel stronger, asking mm -hmm. for help, raising your hand. I mean, for anybody who's listening, like these are power for powerful steps, especially if you're someone who's struggling right now, especially if you're in a dark place. Um, and I think sometimes you gotta just get to the, like I really have to get to the basics. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna sound so basic, but, like, did I eat enough? Mm -hmm. Did I drink enough water? Did I move my body? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I doing the, what I said I was going to do with my daily habits of just reading out of one of my books, writing in my journal, getting my thoughts out of my head and putting them on paper instead? Like, that's why I took that pill, because mm -hmm. I was letting things slip. I wasn't going, I wasn't connecting with my community as enough. I was all work. I was taking care of so many other people and not myself. And I was like, screw that, man. I got to, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of other people. Mm -hmm. Our health is the most important thing. And without our health, we can't enjoy the other things. And I know without, you know, my health, I couldn't enjoy life without my sobriety. I don't get to enjoy life. I don't get to have the relationships. Mm. I don't with my kids, with my husband, with my friends, family, client. I don't, it all goes away. And so getting back to basics and keeping it simple, like super simple, like yeah. never get too hungry, too lonely, um, too tired. Truth. I get hangry all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm like, That's okay. where all of my fights with Aaron and my boyfriend have came from is from one of us getting hangry or one of us stressed out or one of us not getting mm -hmm. enough sleep. So it really, really is. I yeah. think dressing those basics. And then life, it's not that hard sometimes when we address some of those basics. Like yeah. you'll have hard moments, but life as a whole, like there's so much to be grateful for mm -hmm. with like everything you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. One thing I always ask everybody who's been on my show you know, as we we're kind of wrapping it up is if you were able to go back to a younger version of yourself, what is just like one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Trust your gut. Mm. For so long as a little kid, when I was being sexually abused by my stepfather, you know, he was somebody that I trusted. And in my gut, I was like, that's not right. This isn't right. He's like, this is right. This is how fathers teach their daughters. This is how it's done. This is right. And I knew in my gut it wasn't right. So I started to learn to not trust my gut. Mm -hmm. And also, like, it's like the big elephant in the room. Like, does nobody see what's mm -hmm. going on? Like, and, and I wish that I, you know, could just say to everybody, and at every age, always listen to your gut. Your gut doesn't lie. Mm, truth. Your heart might pull you in a direction. Your head might tell you something. Your gut doesn't lie. Your gut, and a lot of times we get into situations, and it took me a long time to start trusting my gut again. Mm. But, um, you know, my husband's so good at it. I'm like, gosh, you were so right about that mm. person. How did you know? Like, you nailed it, like, right away. He's like, I'm, co I'm a cop. That's what mm. kept me alive. I depended on listening to my gut. That kept me alive. And so I think it's really important just keep it, you know, yeah. to keep it as simple as possible to listen to your gut. Trust, your, trust yourself. Yeah. Slow down. Listen. Listen to the message. Hear it. And I, usually we know it pretty fast. But then we allow our thoughts. We allow, you know, people pleasing, the pursuit for accolades, money, all these other uh -huh. different things to get in the way. But I think when we really, really slow down and we listen like typically we we know the answer oh so yeah i love that. Like, especially that's not a help. red flag that's kind of like pinkish that you know like all the red <laughs> flags are coming up and you're like 
that can't be a red flag because mm. I really want this to work or whatever yeah. you tell yourself, you know. You I've focus been... on what we want versus like what our gut really is mm -hmm. ultimately telling us overall. I think that's an awesome piece of advice, especially from the gut health expert. I would I would definitely oh, recommend to yes. listen to your gut. <laughs> um, Amberly, it's been awesome. Thank I you so you. much for, I love you. Thank you for sharing your story with my audience. I know so many people are going to take so much from today from people who are struggling, who know someone who's struggling. You guys, you know, share this podcast with a friend, post it on your stories, social media, take Amberly. Um, and Amberly, where can people find you, learn more about your awesome mastermind, your coaching, your book, all of the incredible things that you're doing? Oh, thank you. AmberlyLago.com is where you can find me. Amberly Lago Motivation on Instagram. My podcast is True Grit and Grace, and we have Miss Rachel Shear on the podcast. And you can text me if you have, like, if you're like, I really have a question, or I really am struggling, or if you want the what I talk about and how I teach resilience is I have a downloadable playbook. Mm. If you text me the word grit, just G-R-I-T to 818-214-7378, you'll get that download. Or you can just text me and say, hey, I'm struggling. Help me out. Uh, I That's that is, you know, what I want to do is I want to help people to be resilient and thrive and, you know, build upon their joy. So, yeah, that is so incredible. Awesome. We will put all of that in the show notes. We will put her phone number. We'll put her link to her social media. So you guys just check that out. Give Amberly a follow. And again, Amberly, thank you so much for coming on my show. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And this has been Sheer Madness. Thank you for putting up with my raspy voice. <laughs>